Welcome to this episode of Prairie People's Poetry, a spotlight series highlighting Saskatchewan spoken word artists through performances and conversation on the craft and community of the art form. I'm your host, Kat Abenstein, and today we're talking with spoken word poet and entrepreneur, Victoria Caroline. I am Victoria Caroline, a spoken word artist and entrepreneur. I hail from Treaty 6 territory. Initially, that was Northern Alberta and now from Saskatoon. Victoria, can you tell me what uh, message your spoken word poetry holds? When I write spoken word poetry, the message is about a variety of things. Um, I started off writing a lot about uh, relationships and the malfunctions of love. Uh, but as I proceed, it's, it's sort of more of becoming uh, a conversation about mental health and, and it's interesting the way that that uh, works its way into society as well, in that every interaction we have with society is also a relationship in and of itself. Who is your audience? Spoken word poetry is a way of sharing my perspective with the world. And anyone who listens to that and shares in that perspective, even just for a moment with me, uh, is my audience. They banned my wrist with the label, unassigned. And I felt like the canary in the coal mine. These deep holes dug by the powers that be, they are waiting for the masses to sicken before they run, only to save themselves. And yet, here I am, caged, chirping, help me, help me. And a benevolent doctor extends his hand with a mitt full of pills and says, take these. And if you're not feeling better in seven days, you can call my receptionist. And I'm not, so I do, and they say, you may make an appointment in 14 days. So I wait, and the doctor shakes his head at my symptoms and refers me to a specialist, and I wait four weeks to hear from them, eight more weeks to see them, and a lifetime for a diagnosis. Meanwhile, my body lacerates skin with knife cuts, make pin cushions of nerve clusters, charges veins with electricity, and I'm told I look well today as if illness needs to be seen to be taken seriously, as if this positivity subverts my prognosis and renders care unnecessary. And I'm caught between putting on a polite face and displaying this pain, but the smile comes easiest, because as birds, we are taught that our lives are meant to be uncomfortable, our bodies made for pain, our suffering just the consequence of the gilded cage, not the air or the food or the water, not the imbalance of delicate ecosystems that the doctors know nothing about, despite the fact that my body has been on earth as long as theirs have. They give me blanket diagnosis comforts. Seat me in a private room beside a cupboard with a sign that says, solutions are in here as if solutions could be packaged into bottles and spread about like creams. And inside my body is still screaming, care for me. Each new symptom, just another level of upping the ante. Are you listening yet? This 30 seconds is not enough time for me to express. And so I write a list and it takes a whole page. Are you listening yet? My deterioration is indication of greater trouble coming. And I am not the only bird lying on the floor of the cage, chirping with her last gasping breath. Are you listening yet? Are you listening? Are you? Why do you think spoken word is such an effective tool when discussing social justice? I think that spoken word is an effective tool for social justice because people allow themselves uh, in a space of vulnerability to say things that they might not actually say to total strangers. But then since we're having that conversation with total strangers, uh, you get exposed to different perspectives that you might not have thought of previously or uh, different things that are affecting the people who are a part of your community. And it puts a face to that. It puts a person behind that message. Uh, and so it comes through very strongly. So what do you hope that your art accomplishes? If we're looking big picture, I hope that my art reaches people who are struggling through the same types of perceptions or relationship difficulties that I struggled through. And in seeing familiarity there, maybe glean a little bit of light into how things can change on an individual and on a societal level. 
My favorite color is purple, though there were times when I wouldn't have admitted it. Would have said it was green so that I wouldn't be seen, or blue so I could blend in with the room, but it was purple. The most underrepresented color in the crayon box. The color I was finally able to claim as my favorite when I claimed my right to femininity. In my 20s, when the imprint of men's hands finally left my skin, I lost the need to hide in baggy blue clothes and skater shoes. When I was 25, I wore the first skirt that I had since I was a child. Embraced purple pride. Young woman, daring to be seen. What's your favorite color, he asked me once. He had this theory that it was likely the color of underwear that I was wearing. He guessed that it was pink because I seemed sweet and innocent. He used the color to steal a mental image of my body, make a disparate, disembodied plaything of me dance across the crosswalk where we met, insisted he would walk me home. I said, I live here, and ducked into a stranger's backyard and disappeared. And what's your favorite color, he asked. And the question seemed out of place, given that this was a sales call at Sears. We called them the sharks of the call center, hang up circling around the ranks until they get the right one, the right voice. And I told him my favorite was red, because I didn't want to give him anything true to know me with, and because I was staring at the page of Roots brand sweaters, asking whether to order him a medium or a large, my blood boiling red because I was not allowed to hang up on him, even as he held me on the line. Conversations proceeding in heights and sighs, culminating in, tell me the total now, slowly. He cancels his order and hangs up calls again. And I'm reprimanded within a thread of my job for hanging up on him. Then I walk home dressed in a darkened disposition black. Get asked, hey sweetie, what's your favorite color? And this time I stand up to a man thrice my size and I say it's purple. The color of royalty, authority, purple, the color of blood rushing up to the surface of skin, blending red and blue, signifying the bruises it takes to demand due dignity, sometimes described as crimson, dark magenta, mysterious majesty, woman birthing baby, purple, hand stained from peeling beets, purple, wine stained feet from crushing grapes for a whole community, purple, and he says, whoa, Chill, I was just asking. So just to talk a little bit about some of your poetry specifically, in purple, you say, young woman, dare to be seen. And in unassigned, you say, are you listening yet? So I wonder if you could elaborate if your poetry helps you to be seen and heard. Yes, I think my poetry helps me to be seen and heard. Uh, when I first started writing, it was a way of affirming my own sense of reality uh, in a world, in an environment which wasn't providing that confidence to me. And so putting it down on the page uh, allowed me to make my perception real. When did you start calling yourself a spoken word artist? I started calling myself a spoken word artist when I was accepted to CFSW for the first time in 2018. Uh, there was a number of competitions, a semifinals and a finals competition, and it was the city of Saskatoon which decided that I was a good enough spoken word poet to go and represent the city on a national stage. Um, just sort of to change gears a little bit, uh, you, you were talking about um, you know, going for your master's for psychology and things like that. But in terms of your spoken word practice, what sort of professional development have you done? Or what sort of practices do you employ to become a better artist? Some practices I employ to be a better artist is actually to produce art without the intention of ever sharing it. Um, there's been periods of times, especially when there was a lot of pressure placed on me as an artist, like you have to go to this competition and be good, you know, and what, what is a good poem? I don't know if anyone has an answer to that because it's so subjective. And when I was putting that pressure on myself that whatever I produced had to be good, I froze up. I stopped writing for a little while. And the way that I got back into it was actually by writing pages. I would write 
and then flip the page over and write over everything that I had already written so that I couldn't use it as a poem to share with an audience. And by doing that, I kind of got the creative juices flowing of like, it doesn't matter what I wrote because it just is what it is. And I also wrote a lot of just um, no edit poetry and some of them turned out really well. Some of them are shit. Some of them I just threw out. <laughs> uh, but it really helped me uh, progress as an artist. This land of metal never taught me how to live. And as for my teachers, no true knowledge did they give. Smarten up and settle, live a dull life to your grave. Well, if that's the way this game is played, I'll escape, quit, without save. And check out my mental health. I'd rather than participate further in all of this blather. And doctor, convince my friends and loved ones that it's just a phase. And that in my treatment, there should be no delays. It's all because of my twisted outlook on life and not depression, aggression, oppression, or strife. But we care more for our cars than our children, while the garden breathes in poison and the fruit pulps of our labor harden. And you call me crazy. Well, I say you don't dream. You'd forfeit utopia for a government scheme. For the welfare of your neighbors, you've no reason to grieve, because you've prescribed to the lies that were designed to deceive. We build communities smaller than the cities we live in, in which worth is based off consumer concepts of sin, and this uninspired life leaves you feeling content? Well, not me. So please listen. This is my heart's lament. Thinking about relationship, can you tell me what community means to you? Community feels like an idea of people all coming together uh, for the well-being of everybody. And it can be as small as a couple of friends, and it can be as large as a nation. And in fact, I think it needs to be as large as a nation or as large as the world. <laughs> uh, do you find community with your spoken word? I certainly do. Um, I find community in the spoken word in the sense of these are big conversations that we're having. Social change is happening in our community of artists. Do you think there's a difference between spoken word poetry and uh, traditional page poetry? I do think that there's a difference between spoken poetry and page poetry, except I don't think it's as easily defined as we might desire. Um, but spoken word poetry is uh, an embodied art. Uh, so the way that you are engaging with the audience is a part of the message and a part of the artistry. Uh, rather than putting a poem on page, it can be interpreted in a number of ways. In some ways with spoken word poetry, you get to design that and be a part of that experience at the same time as the audience is. Do you enjoy the act of poetry slam or, or slamming poetry? <laughs> Uh, my answer is complicated. Yes, I do enjoy poetry slams, uh, but I also don't enjoy poetry slams uh, because in some ways I think that it shifts the art form a little bit where it, it changes it from being uh, for the purpose of ex personal expression and into the purpose of winning an audience over. And so the, the content and the voice, it, it inevitably changes, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. It's just not the reason I'm here doing spoken word poetry. Do you ever dabble in other art forms as well as spoken word? And if so, do you ever um, meld those together with your poetry? Uh, I do dabble in other art forms other than spoken word. Uh, I actually, uh, I had written a few poems, I mean, as far back as high school. Uh, but I started writing a book, a, a book that's actually prose. Uh, and while I was writing this book, I realized that so much of it came out as poetry, just kind of incidentally, accidentally. Uh, so I went with it. And uh, that's actually why I'm where I am today. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about some of the opportunities you've been presented because of your spoken word poetry? 
Spoken word poetry has allowed me to travel all the way across Canada sharing a message, um, participating twice on the national stage at CFSW, as well as going on a little tour with a, with a band, actually. I was their um, interim uh, artist when they had to do sound checks. Uh, it would uh, entertain the audience. Um, and so it's just led me on a lot of adventure, <laughs> I'd say. We've been here before, lying on a bed in some basement suite, high on something a friend gave you last week. You know, they say that time is space, and I'm feeling that today. You're right beside me, skin upon skin, and yet I am eons away. I'm feeling burdened by my memory. Conflicts between you and me, cycles repeating again and again, like those spheres dancing together in the sky, creating seasons, day and night. It feels so fixed, like we can't get past this. And I can feel it. Tensions building in a summer calm. It's like the heavy air of a rain that never comes. I'm stepping across stones, too pokey and sand, too hot. I'm told that we are OK when I know that we are not. And then all that we have grown together dies back in cold night soils. The fruits we have refused to pick all spoil, and we are back in the same place we were the last time all the beauty we had withered and fell. I know the pattern well. A cold north wind blows in overnight. It's a frigid winter storm of snow, sleet, and ice, and I am so confused by all of the feelings involved in a precipitation that falls in all directions at once. It threatens my security my sanity, and I shiver in the intimidation, quake in the argumentation, and freeze in the blame. And all of this is why I cannot press it from my mind. I want so badly to feel safe with you, but my history tells me not to. And it's not only you. Those many atrocities that came before you tell me not to open, not to trust. And I wish you were a different type of human, but you're not. And so I need you to show you that these things are all connected. I need you to see that I am infected by all of these moments in space and time, so I illuminate the seasons. I walk you through the cycles. I show you the notes that I have been taken so that you will know that there will never be a next spring. Do you have any goals for publication or books or anything like that? Yes. Uh, I mean, I have a couple uh, personal published chat books, uh, which are really fun pet projects for me. Uh, however, I do have a, a bigger project kind of on the back burner. Um, I'm writing a book about uh, the influences that sexual abuse had in my life, uh, hopefully with the intention of telling a story, not only for the people who are experiencing sexual abuse, but for the people in their lives, um, the men or the people who might not understand why it is that they're feeling the way that they feel and why they behave the way that they behave. And doing this through you know, interpersonal storytelling, uh, but also from the foundation of like, what we know about psychology of sexual abuse. Um, and the reason I say it's on the back burner is because a lot of it has written, uh, but I do want to be responsible in my uh, completion of that project. And so the rest of it I'm going to tackle again after I receive my master's in psychology so that I know that the things I'm saying aren't going to perpetuate more harm to the community and to the people that I'm trying to help. Do you have any advice for any other artists, spoken word artists? My advice to other spoken word artists is to not be afraid to embarrass yourself. I see so many people go up on stage with wonderful acts that could be so engaging if they just allowed themselves to be there a little bit more, um, to, to be a little bit silly, to, to act the part a bit more than what they are. And I think that, myself included, there's a little bit of fear attached to that in the sense that we don't want to put ourselves out there uh, and you know, do that embarrassing thing. But every time you do that, you learn and you grow and your art will become so much better for it. Can you elaborate a little bit about 
what it means to be a responsible artist in terms of uh, audience care? Responsibility to our audience is something that I've given a lot of thought to. And I'm not even sure yet if I have an answer to how to accomplish that. But I think that as a community, we are working on it a, a lot. Um, I know that when I first came into poetry, it was a way of expressing the things which hurt the most in me. But over time, I started to realize that as I expressed that to the audience, I was hurting them too. And so my responsibility is in sending the message out there, and, but not perpetuating it, not repeating it more than is necessary, uh, giving the audience a little bit of space away from that, as well as the opportunity to engage with it, uh, so that there's the balance there. A little bit of joy, a little bit of pain. That's what life is about, right? <laughs> this has been Prairie People's Poetry with me, Kat Abenstein, as your host. Thanks to Victoria Caroline for her work, and thanks to you for tuning in. Make sure to like, share, and stay tuned for the other videos in our series, and let us know what you think. Thanks for supporting Prairie Poetry.